Funding for Shape Realist is provided by Squarespace, the sponsor of today's video. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. You know, if I had a nickel for every time I analyzed a Zelda game on its 20th anniversary, I'd have two nickels. Which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it happened twice, right? A little too weird, in fact. I'm breaking the tradition and reviewing Skyward Sword during its 10-year anniversary. Since it seems like an appropriate time to do so, thanks to that HD remake that just came out. And boy, is there a lot to talk about. As I mentioned in my Majora's Mask and Ocarina of Time reviews, Skyward Sword was the first Zelda game I ever played. I got into the series through Chucky Conroy's Let's Plays of Wind Waker and Majora's Mask during late 2011, but I didn't have access to either of those games to play myself. Luckily, a brand spankin' new Zelda game was about to release for the Wii, which was the only console I owned at the time. And I didn't have access to virtual console games because I had no internet, so I couldn't get Majora, so there you go. So I got Skyward Sword for Christmas, and I just fell in love with it. The characters, the story, the art style, the one-to-one -one sword combat, the backtracking, the tad tones, the fi interruptions, the imprisoned, the imprisoned a second time, the imprisoned a third time. It was amazing, kinda. On my first playthrough, I didn't really notice many of the game's flaws because I was just excited by how grand this game's story was and how cool the motion controls were at the time. And I feel like that was the case for a lot of people, including professional reviewers. The game was highly acclaimed upon its release, but as the years went on, opinions of it really soured. People didn't like its linearity, how barren the sky was, how much the game repeated content, how shoehorned in the motion controls were, and perhaps most of all, how annoying of a companion Phi was. And yes, let's get this out of the way, I pronounce it Phi, not Fee. In my mind, it derives from the word identify, and that's how I perceived her name for the past 10 years. If you disagree with my pronunciation, oh well, who cares, she's a shit character anyway. Oh wait, I'm getting ahead of myself. Anyway, yeah, Skyward Sword didn't have great reception as time went on, but the thing is, that's nothing new for this series. You've probably heard of the infamous Zelda cycle, where a major installment in the series comes out, people hate it in the years after its release, then the next game comes out and everyone looks back at the previous game like, perhaps I treated you too harshly. Die! Everyone hated Wind Waker's kitty art style. Then Twilight Princess came out but forgot to include color and everyone said, wait, I take it back, Wind Waker was good. Then Skyward Sword comes out and people hate how weird it is, realizing that, hey, Twilight Princess may be a pretty standard Zelda game, but it was a very, very good good standard Zelda game. We like it now. Skyward Sword fans just kind of held their breath during the mid-2010s, waiting for the next major Zelda game to come out and get all the fans to realize that Skyward Sword was pretty damn good in hindsight. But that didn't happen. The Zelda cycle was broken, because the next major game in the series was Breath of the Wild, the most beloved and iconic entry in the franchise since Ocarina of Time. One of the most groundbreaking current-gen titles to come out of any studio. It expanded on some of Skyward Sword's ideas, like the stamina meter and collecting little bugs and trinkets, but for the most part, this was a massive 180 from Skyward Sword in terms of gameplay, structure, and presentation. Where Skyward Sword railroaded you down a fixed path, Breath of the Wild let you go anywhere, anytime. Where Skyward Sword had you sit through hours of forced cutscenes you may or may not care about, Breath of the Wild left the vast majority of its story optional, only to be seeked out by those who are truly interested in it. Everything in Breath of the Wild runs so counter to Skyward Sword that to this day, I can't fathom the idea that these were made by the same team. In a way, you could argue that Skyward Sword is what really broke the camel's back and made the Zelda team realize that the traditional Zelda formula was getting stale and needed to be reworked. It's hard not to subconsciously view Skyward Sword as a failure given how much Breath of the Wild left it in the dust in terms of gameplay. And as Breath of the Wild maintains the same level of critical acclaim it received at launch over four years ago, Skyward Sword has only been looked down upon even more so than it already was. But in spite of the fanbase's general disdain for the game, it's not like Nintendo wants to bury it or anything. They still prop it up as a major part of the franchise, there are tons of references to the game within Breath of the Wild, and most significantly of all, they just dropped a $60 HD remake of it for the Nintendo Switch that barely fixes any structural problems with the game, outside of some quality of life improvements and the option to use button controls. Hey, remember how Wind Waker HD overhauled the visuals entirely, added a faster sale, made the universally hated Triforce Peace Hunt way more tolerable, made the Pictograph side quest 
way more tolerable added a really cute tingle bottle meavers feature and generally made what would otherwise just be an hd port of an old ass game into a headlining experience for wii u owners hey remember how twilight princess made noticeable improvements to the visuals streamlined the wolf bug collecting part added a ton of cute new collectibles and also included an entirely new dungeon for the wolf form which you needed an amiibo to unlock which is an utterly idiotic and maniacal decision but hey at least if you have the amiibo you get a new dungeon yeah skyward sword hd laughs in the face of its predecessors and adds nothing its quality of life improvements are more than welcome and it's almost certainly the definitive version of skyward sword because of these improvements but it has no new content on offer whatsoever with this port nintendo really only did the bare minimum to make this game tolerable rather than adding anything of substance or fixing one of the game's actual structural problems like wind waker hd did with the triforce hunt I bought Skyward Sword HD with the intention to potentially review it, not because it looked like an appealing product. And yeah, I'm just gonna say right now, it is definitely not worth the $60. The fact that this 10-year-old Wii port is the same price as Breath of the Wild is asinine. I'm not even as head over heels in love with Breath of the Wild as most other Zelda fans are, but it's absolutely the better game that's more worth your $60. With that said, if you completely disregard the price for a moment, Skyward Sword HD is still a good package. As I said before, it's absolutely the definitive way to play this game. And before I really dive into Skyward Sword proper, I want to go over the differences in this version and why I think it's a worthwhile experience if you can find it for like $30 at Walmart or something. First of all, even though the visuals of Skyward Sword HD aren't overhauled, they still look significantly crisper and less blurry than the originals, so that's nice. I'll get more into this later, but personally, I've always loved Skyward Sword's art style and I didn't think it needed too much work if it was ever going to be put in HD, so this pretty much does everything I'd hoped for in the visual department. The reduced interruptions from Fi are absolutely magnificent. I never found myself getting annoyed by her over the course of the game, because instead of popping out to give me advice I didn't even want, her icon just kind of appears at the bottom of the screen sometimes sometimes, and it's easily ignorable. With that said, she definitely leaves less of an impact in this version of the game, which is probably a good thing for most players, myself included. But if this were my first time playing Skyward Sword, she really wouldn't stick out in my mind that much because of how comparatively limited her screen time is now. She kind of reminds me of the King of Red Lions in that regard, and this reduced screen time does kind of dampen a portion of the game later on, which we will talk about eventually. But with all that said, she's generally a very flat character anyway, so it's not like you're really missing much by not having her show up too often. Dowsing is also far less intrusive. In the original game, it felt like this mechanic was holding you you hostage by constantly beeping until you activated it, forcing you to find things just by following this hideous purple radar circle rather than actually exploring and discovering stuff for yourself. In this version, I kind of forgot Dowsing was there at times, and I just kind of explored on my own to find things like the Kikwis or the keys to the first Elden Dungeon. It felt freeing. And yeah, you could technically play this way in the original, but I was subconsciously afraid to because the game wouldn't stop beeping at me every time I tried to ignore the Dowsing. Like, sorry, okay, I'll use the big ugly purple border, just don't yell at me. The item descriptions no longer repeat themselves every time you boot up the game, which is an obvious godsend and really should have been caught by the original developers. Speeding up text and skipping cutscenes is also fantastic. There's a ton of the story I just don't want to sit through again, so thank you for this. Honestly, part of me wondered how I even put up with the original Skyward Sword. These quality of life improvements just streamlined the overall experience so well. But let's get to the biggest change of all the button controls. The original Skyward Sword was a game all too eager to use the Wii Motion Plus to its fullest potential, which apparently included sticking it in places it didn't belong. The sword combat was a pretty solid use for it, and I think it worked pretty well overall. Everything else didn't. The game also forced you to awkwardly angle your wrist and flap the Wii Remote to fly a bird, awkwardly angle your wrist to swim, awkwardly angle your wrist to pilot the beetle, awkwardly angle your wrist to insert a key into a door, are you fucking kidding me? Even basic stuff like aiming your bow just never felt right in Skyward Sword and would constantly misalign because they elected not to just use the pointer, which worked extremely well in Twilight Princess and would have also worked here. I didn't mind any of this on my first playthrough of the game way back when because the motion controls were new and cool and I liked the idea of translating my airplane skills in Wii Sports Resort to an actual adventure game, but they got old real fast. As the years went on, whenever I got a hankering to replay a Zelda game, I would look at all of them next to each other and say, hmm, I could replay Skyward Sword and deal with the constant misalignment of the Wii Remote, awkwardly flapping my wrist to control the Loftwing, and a whole host of structural problems that I'll get into later, or I could play 
any of the other 3D Zelda games and not do that. I always ended up choosing any of the other 3D Zelda games. I believe I fully played through Skyward Sword three times on the Wii during the past 10 years, and each time brought with it less and less enthusiasm for the motion controlled segments outside of the sword. And I must stress again that this was really only a Skyward Sword issue, not an issue with the Wii or motion controls as a whole. I replayed the Galaxy games to death. They're some of my favorite video games ever, and I feel like the Wii Mote spin and motion controlled segments in that game are super fun. And Wii Sports Resort is a banger, especially the sword play and island flyover. They still Lap. I don't know what it is about Skyward Sword in comparison, but I just couldn't get behind the way it implemented flying. And while the sword controls were pretty good and a cool change of pace for the franchise, I'm not gonna lie, I'd trade them in for the reliability of button controls in a heartbeat. Anyway, Skyward Sword HD has button controls. Push the button! While I was kind of skeptical on how they'd make this game work when it was so previously reliant on motion, I have to admit, they did a really good job with it. This game is honestly so much better without tedious, unnecessary motion control bullshit. Again, not knocking motion controls as a whole, they're amazing for stuff like like gyro aim, which I still ended up using in this game even though I turned buttons on. I'm honestly shocked that was even an option. But yeah, piloting the bird and the beetle like a normal person, aiming my bow without it getting ridiculously misaligned, tilting the key to put it in the boss door without contorting my wrist, having the harp actually function? Absolutely incredible, I had the time of my life. It's so nice to have options on how you want to control a game. On the flip side, there's the sword controls, which I'm a little more mixed on. First of all, it's a shame that when playing with button controls, the right stick controls the sword, meaning you have to awkwardly hold down one of the left triggers in order to use the new free camera. At one point, I just kind of gave up on the free camera and kept snapping the camera behind me like how it was in the original Skyward Sword. But aside from that minor grievance, the real issue I have with button map sword controls in this game is just how bizarre it feels. Like, when every combat encounter revolves around the idea that you can swing your sword in any direction, it just feels incredibly unconventional and odd to do that with an analog stick. I mean, it works better than I anticipated, but it still just feels off. Like, you can tell the game wasn't originally designed to be played this way, and you can never really shake that feeling as the game goes on. I also feel like the motion controls were just better for certain sequences, like the Kaloktos boss battle. In the original Skyward Sword, this is one of the greatest boss battles in video game history, because you get to swing these massive swords and rip this giant robot to shreds. It's phenomenal. Glory be to our lord and savior, Kaloktos. In Skyward Sword HD, the button controls just don't feel good for this fight. It feels way less visceral and more formulaic, like any old boss fight in any Zelda game. The same can be said for the final Gear Him battle, which, while still fun and climactic, honestly felt way too easy with the button controls. The challenge and joy of this fight in the original was frantically doing the same motions Link did in order to keep up with all the ways Gear Him blocked your attacks. With buttons, it feels a lot more like a standard boss battle, and while it's still a good boss, I just didn't feel the same visceral rush when fighting him as I did in the original. And you might be thinking, well, this version also has motion controls with the Joy-Cons, why not just use them for the sword? Well, dear viewer, ignoring how annoying it is to have to go into the options menu every time you want to switch between motion and button controls, I've tested the motion controls out a couple times, and they just don't work for me at all. It feels like I always have to make big sweeping gestures for the controller to pick up my actions, which is never a problem I have with the Wii Remote. The Joy-Con motion controls just feel really unrefined and untested, which is a problem I had with Galaxy's pointer controls in 3D All-Stars as well. On top of that, I recently developed tendonitis, so it's probably not a good idea to use motion controls that much. Big F. Oh well, the button controls work, like I said. It's just kinda weird to have to use them on enemies that clearly weren't designed with them in mind. But that's fine. The only point in the game where I was aggravated by the button controls was this boss fight against the robot pirate guy on both the sand ship and the sky keep. Clicking the left stick down at the perfect time to shield bash this guy is just not intuitive compared to shaking the nunchuck. And this boss just wiped the floor with me. It was an actual nightmare, and I'll probably fight through the tendonitis and turn motion controls on just for this mini boss if I ever replay this game. But yeah, as a whole, this is definitely the definitive version of Skyward Sword, even if the Wiimote controls have their quirky charms. And since this is the best way to play Skyward Sword, free of so many of those egregious inconveniences that plague the original version, we're gonna take a look at Skyward Sword HD and see if the actual game at its core holds up or not. And as usual, let's break it down, starting with... As a kid, I was always blown away by Skyward Sword's story. It was truly mind-blowing. I was invested in the struggle to save Zelda, I loved watching Groose's character development, I looked forward to each encounter with Girahim, oh man, it was such an amazing story. Wait, I didn't describe the story at all, I just described the characters. Yeah, here's the thing, over the years I've started to realize that Skyward Sword's story 
is nothing special. It's a pretty basic narrative where Link has to save a loved one, a narrative push that Wind Waker and Twilight Princess already used. But where Skyward Sword differs is through the setup of this relationship. In Wind Waker, your sister getting kidnapped is a solid starting motivation, but you don't spend a ton of time getting to know her in the beginning of the game. And for most of the first act, you just kind of forget about her while you go to the islands your talking boat tells you to go to in order to get some shiny pearls. And in Twilight Princess, Ilya is boring and rude and I couldn't care less about her, and these kids are kind of generic and whatever. Also, Melo is definitely Satan, so I don't really want to save him. I, th I think he'll be fine on his own. Actually, Satan! That's uncalled for. I'm personally more invested in helping Midna along and figuring out what happened to her and why this kingdom has been bathed in Twilight. Rescuing people that are quote-unquote close to Link barely even crosses my mind when I think about this game and its story. But with Skyward Sword, I have never been more motivated to do anything in my life than rescue this precious being. I love Skyward Sword Zelda more than I love myself, and the relationship between Link and Zelda is what really carries the opening hour of the game. Well, that and Groose. Every time I replay this game and I think about how annoying some of the tutorials can be at the start, I just remember, wait a minute, this is quality Zelda time that I'm not going to get at any other point in the game. I really appreciate how this game takes its time to showcase these childhood friends start to lean into a romantic relationship. And the great thing about the HD version is that you can still skip some of these cutscenes if you're not interested. It really is the best of both worlds. Giving Zelda so much screen time here at the start of the game is so crucial since rescuing her is your primary motivator for the first act of the game. And it's a damn good motivator. I never once questioned why I was doing the things I was doing during these first three dungeons and all the in-between stuff, because I had to save Zelda, my beloved! The person I grew up with, the person I actually got to spend time with as the player, the person who went up to that potion vendor at the bazaar and said, excuse me, he asked for no pickles. She's awesome. So yeah, even though this game's primary motivator seems to be played out within the Zelda franchise, I think Skyward Sword still did it the best. To this day, this game has my favorite iteration of Zelda in the entire series. And I think this version of Link is a pretty underrated one as well. The dialogue options in this game really helped you graft your own personality onto Link, even though they ultimately don't amount to anything gameplay-wise. I still nonetheless get a ton of joy from picking the Am I Late option at the Gate of Time battle, promising to wake Zelda up before she goes to sleep, and making fun of Groose's hair. Yeah, can't go wrong with that option. Aside from that, this dude is probably the second most expressive Link in the whole series. He was never gonna top Toon Link, but his face nonetheless gives him a ton of personality and charm. I just think he's so relatable and easy to put yourself in the shoes of. Anyway, there's other cool characters as well, like Girahim, my boy. This fabulous demon lord is just the perfect rival. You love to loathe him. I honestly think he's my favorite villain in the entire series, because he's cold and menacing, while also being larger than life and hilarious. You can't argue with his sick dance moves, come on. Impa and the old woman are nice inclusions, and there's also a ton of great side characters that rarely ever get any attention. Almost every Zelda world is populated with a ton of memorable NPCs for you to encounter in your quest, and this one is no exception. The Thunder Dragon is a bro. I love his voice clips and thunder claps and it's just so much fun saving his life and getting this epic boss rush challenge in return. I really like this one Goron archaeologist who you encounter all the time. Just seeing him get so excited about goddess walls and cubes and the like is so infectious. Like, now I'm excited too. What a guy. Bucha is... Yeah. This flying robot that simps for Fi is always super funny. Especially when he acts like a little bitch and forces you to do an escort mission up the mountain, which doesn't even make sense because you should have landed towards the top of the mountain anyway. So that's funny. Thank you, game. You definitely didn't waste enough of my time already. Oh, sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, who could forget Levius, the flying space whale who you encounter twice. And yet, for some reason, Nintendo shoved into Hyrule Warriors and Smash for Wii U as if he was a main character. While we're on the subject, why is there a trophy of Owlin in Smash for Wii U? Who was asking? for this. I literally wouldn't remember this guy's name at all if he didn't have a trophy in this game for no reason. Just like Flint Cragley from Super Paper Mario. Who asked for this? Oh well. The good news is Owlin is the exception in terms of the Skyloft residents. So many of them are extremely memorable, and I especially love how almost all of them get their own side quest. And I especially, especially love how all of these side quests are tied back to gratitude crystals. I never see anyone talk about this when they talk about Skyward Sword, but I love the way that every side quest up in the sky is inherently linked through Batro. Or as a kid, I always pronounced it Batriex. 
Whatever, the point is the super friendly demon really wants to be a human. So you need to collect these star bits for him that only show up when you do kind things for others. Or, you know, just randomly lying around at night for some reason. This is such a cool mechanic. It motivated me to want to complete side quests and see what rewards I get from him. And unlike, say, the Skulltula is the not great enough time, where you really only need to collect 50, because then they run out of useful rewards for you. In this game, you really want to see Betro's gratitude quest through to the end. Because you really want to help your demon bro out and make him a human. It's so rewarding to finally do so after an entire game's worth of side quests. And much like Majora's Mask, it makes it so I always want to complete every side quest whenever I replay the game. Just such a cool idea. They did a banger ass job with this guy. The side quests themselves are decent. Many of them are just a matter of finding a lost item beneath the clouds or in Skyloft for a certain NPC. And while those are basic, it's just nice to make these peeps happy. Some of the more memorable side quests are the ones where the item check girl randomly falls in love with you and you can either date her or turn her down in order to get gratitude from her father. There's this one where Beetle loses his prized bug and you have to get it back by beating this thin, creepy guy's Bug Island minigame. There's the one that features the return of the hand in the toilet from Majora's Mask. And one of Groose's lackeys wants you to deliver a letter to this girl he likes. And you can either do that and watch him get his heart broken when the guy she actually likes shows up to stop the proposal. Or you can just give the letter to Toilet Hand and watch him get his heart broken. Doing either option will net you the same rewards, so it's really up to you how you want to ruin this guy's life. I personally always go for the one where he's haunted by Toilet Hand forever, but both options are equally valid. There's a side quest where you get to watch Gapora bathe. Oh wait, that's not a side quest, that's just a random thing you can do. You can... You can watch this old man bathe if you want. I say we take a bath! And then there's my personal favorite side quest in the game, Link's Lumpy Pumpkin Adventures. Even though the harp section sucks, I still love this one. Basically, at the very beginning of the game, you can fly to this inn shaped like a pumpkin. Okay, pretty normal so far, right? Then you walk in, and you see there's a piece of heart on the chandelier. Well, you can't just not take that, but how are you gonna get it down? Lol, just ram the wall a few times and cause the chandelier to drop on the table below where customers are sitting. You are a complete and utter lunatic with no regard for public safety and no empathy for others. I hope you're happy. You get a piece of heart, but the owner and his daughter are pissed and forced you into indentured servitude. You have to deliver soup for the owner, help his daughter carry some pumpkins into the shed, and play your harp during one of her performances. Over time, they both start to warm up to you even though you destroyed their big chandelier and nearly killed people for your own selfish gains and probably got them fined by OSHA. And that's wholesome. I really just like vibing at this inn with this super sweet pumpkin girl who even needs Zelda anymore. So yeah, this game's characters are a hoot. Probably the second best cast in the entire Zelda series right after Majora's Mask. Speaking of which, I love how this game keeps up the tradition from the Ocarina and Majora days of having super deformed looking NPCs. It's pretty funny and charming. One thing I always love doing in this game is just standing next to Birdie, the potion vendor, and just comparing Link's design to his. Like, yep, these are both humans apparently. They are the same species, why not? But yeah, I love this game's characters and side quests, and I feel like neither really get enough credit. They may not have the same depth as the Majora's Mask peeps, but there is some depth and progression to some of these peeps. I guess they poured all that depth and character progression into one place. They probably just made a single, nuanced, believable, and amazing character that changed the course of human history and made the world into a paradise with all its problems solved. But whom's could that be? Is there a single character in existence that's that? That amazing? Bitch, you already know. Don't play coy with me. Let's talk about... I'm gonna put the actual song. Bruce single-handedly watered my crops, snatched my wig, ended world hunger, redistributed the billionaire's wealth, and revived the Owl House for an extended season 3. He is the reason I get up in the morning and the definitive proof that God exists. Checkmate, atheists. The crazy thing about Bruce is, he honestly has no reason to be as fleshed out as he is. You could probably do the story without him. Narratively, nothing would change if he never came to the surface. They just included him in the story and gave him this amazing character arc just because. Because they could. Because they wanted to, I guess. And that's amazing. Because to this day, I don't think there's any other character in the series quite like Groose. Every other major player in this game has some sort of counterpart in another game in the series, whether it be a literal other version of Link, Zelda, or Impa, or an extremely similar character like Yuga is to Girahim. But there's never really been another Groose, before or after Skyward Sword. And so, I'd like to break his character down for a hot minute here. These are the things that I dedicate entire segments to in my Zelda reviews. Groose, and the empty bottles in Majora's Mask specifically. I am really good at priorities. 
So your first encounter with Groose comes right at the beginning of the game, since he's apparently stolen your loft wing and hid it in a way. You gotta confront him about this, and in doing so, you're bombarded with blah, 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 blah. Groose's theme is so amazing, you have no idea. It perfectly captures his pompous yet goofy attitude, and it's a delight to hear over and over again. You have the option to make fun of his hair here, and it's basically required. Like, I physically can't bring myself to pick the other two options. You can never go wrong with dissing this man's yee-yee ass haircut. Pointy hair! Pointy hair! Hair! Then Zelda chimes in to bail you out, and he gets all flustered and bails himself. Ha! She got your ass! Groose during the first hour of the game is just such a marvelous asshole who you really want to take down. The fact that he's as fun and goofy as he is makes him much less of a nuisance and more of a worthy opponent. Your battle with him is legendary! Or er, well, I mean, it's okay. It's just kind of a simple bird segment where you gotta get the thingy to win the game, and it's, it's not hard. But sticking it to Groose? So worth it. And then the actual game, for lack of a better term, kicks off, and you're leaving all these Skyloft folk behind for an adventure under the clouds. You just kind of assume Groose is going to be a mopey NPC for the rest of the game, and that there's no chance of him factoring into the main plot again. And then, after completing the first three dungeons and returning to the Steel Grounds to get your next assignment, the greatest cutscene in Zelda history plays. Out of nowhere, after it's been so long since he was relevant to anything, Groose follows you to the surface and f***s up your landing because he's that invested in Zelda's whereabouts. Link explains to Groose what's going on, off screen of course, because showing Link talk in a Zelda game is punishable by death at Nintendo HQ. And now that he's caught up, Groose resolves to single-handedly save Zelda himself, only to get told by the old woman that that's not what's gonna happen, and yet he tries to do it anyway. But he gets a little shaken up by the imprisoned, j j just a tad. He realizes he couldn't do anything to stop this gigantic monster, and he's dumbfounded by the fact that shrimpy little Link could. And this puts him on a path of self-reflection and self-actualization, where he realizes that he may not be able to physically repel the demons that threaten the land and Zelda, but he can still assist Link in his own creative, out-of-the-box way. Like building a giant catapult to stun the imprisoned with bombs, something that turns out to be an absolute necessity when dealing with this f***ing monstrosity. And I mean monstrosity in more ways than one. I don't know about you boys, but I absolutely love the trope where the pompous or arrogant character goes through an arc where they realize that someone they previously looked down on is more suited for the heroic role, and that they can still make a difference contributing from the sidelines. This concept is put to such wonderful effect through Groose. He slowly comes to acknowledge Link's role as a true hero and as the one who should greet Zelda in the past. Even though finding her was his primary motivator for coming down here in the first place, he willingly steps aside as a testament to how much he respects Link and how much he's grown as a person, but he still plays it off as coolly as possible. He maintains his goofy and upbeat attitude throughout the entirety of the game, no matter how dark things get. The only difference is that now that goofy attitude is being paired with a truly noble and selfless individual, not just a pompous jerk. It's such an amazing journey for someone who, again, did not need to be part of this story. Just on a whim, the Zelda team gave us the most compelling character arc in the series. And it worked wonders. To this day, Groose is perhaps the most popular character to come out of this game. And the fact that he wasn't in Hyrule Warriors will haunt me forever. But oh well, his time in Skyward Sword is more than enough to satiate me. I love his over-the-top movements, his kooky jokes, and above all, his personal journey of becoming a true hero in his own right. The Legend of Groose is a f***ing banger game. 10 out of 10. I wish I could say the same about The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword, however. Master, a report. I calculate a 69% probability that we can save Zelda by creating a beautiful website that advertises the fact that she is missing and that people should be on the lookout for her. I highly recommend using Squarespace in order to create this beautiful website. Here is more information about Squarespace presented in a convenient advertisement format. Squarespace is a fantastic, intuitive, online website builder that allows you to create beautiful websites for your business or personal hobby. Present your work using Squarespace's professional portfolio designs. Display projects in customizable galleries and add password-protected pages to share private work with clients. You can even present your videos from YouTube, Vimeo, and Animoto on your Squarespace site. Add an image overlay to your video to improve your website's load speed by waiting to embed video players until playback starts. Every design automatically includes a unique mobile experience that 
matches the overall style of your website. So your content will look great on every device, every time. And if you don't want that, you can always disable the mobile view from Website Manager. Buying a domain from Squarespace is simple because there are no hidden fees or price hikes. Each domain comes with an ad-free parking page and free WHOIS privacy on eligible domains. Squarespace sells over 200 top-level domains so you can find the perfect name for your website. Choose a URL that ends in .com, .net, .org, or if you're feeling funky, you can get a more specific one like .art. If you're ready to share your passions or promote your business with the rest of the world, head to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. In case it wasn't clear already, I really like Skyward Sword. However, it's incredibly hard for me to say that I love the game, despite my fond nostalgic memories for it, and despite the fact that it does a ton of things really well. I love the characters, as I said, and now is a good time as any to talk about how gorgeous the art style is. The impressionist style used here was already my favorite in the entire series back on Wii, and now that it's a little crisper on the Switch, bada boom, best art style in a Zelda game ever, even better than Wind Waker's, I will fight you on that. But with that said, yeah, we can't really avoid talking about this game's severe structural problems forever. Let's discuss what I consider to be the three-act decline of Skyward Sword. It derives its name from the fact that you can pretty much break this game up into three distinct acts. The first three dungeons and everything in between them that embodies the hunt for Zelda. Everything from the end of the third dungeon to the point where you get the true Master Sword is, well, the quest to get the Master Sword. And after that we have the Song of the Hero quest which leads into the end game. These are the three acts of Skyward Sword, and while the three-act decline implies that the game gradually gets weaker as it goes along, that's not entirely true. In my opinion, the highest points of this game are actually in the second and third acts. The Silent Realms, the Ancient Cistern, the Sandship, and the entire last hour are all the best parts of this game in my opinion. The problem, however, is that all of this great content is sandwiched between a seemingly unending amount of tedious bullshit you're forced to do for seemingly no good reason. Even though the first act is just kinda your typical Zelda content that's solid but doesn't stand out too much, it's nonetheless the most consistent act of the whole game and it doesn't really have any frustrating or annoying parts. For that reason, it's incredibly difficult to pick out exactly which of these acts is my favorite overall. But with that said, we might as well just go through them all now. Let's see what this game forces you to do and if it's even worth it or not. After Zelda's snatched down to the surface by a nasty ass tornado, Link's first task is to go find her. You start out by exploring the Faron Woods area, meeting the Kikwis, the mysterious old lady, and Girahim, my beloved, and doing a functional but forgettable first dungeon. At the end of it, you're told your princess is in another castle. Tough, but fair. This doesn't diminish your motivation to find Zelda, I mean, we'll get her next time. We then move on to Elden Volcano, where we ascend this mountain, meet the Magmas, and explore a much hotter dungeon. Do I mean hotter in terms of temperature, or in terms of sexiness? Yes. yes! This time you actually get a glimpse of Zelda, but this bitch Impa won't let you reunite, cause apparently, you're late. She's not paying for those. <laughs> Okay, fine, whatever. We got closer this time. The motivation is still strong. These two areas were perfectly decent, fairly fun worlds to explore, but Laneru Desert is where we really kick it up a notch. For all its faults, Skyward Sword figured out how to make deserts fun. All you have to do is turn the desert into not a desert anymore. Wow, problem solved. The introduction of time shift stones and the ancient robots is a fantastic one, and the dungeon is even better than the last two. It also helps that this area takes one of the coolest items in the Zelda series, the beetle and makes it even more fun to use through a cool upgrade, while also introducing a new fun item of its own, the Gust Bellows. That's right, Smash players, you have Skyward Sword to thank for these wonderful, totally fair additions to the item roster. At least Girahim's a cool assist trophy. Hey, did you know that apparently Girahim cannot appear on the Peach's Castle stage? That that's, that's very random, why just the one stage and no others? Did Peach lace this weird, abstract pile of platforms with holy water? And how come Palutena didn't do the same for her temple? Smash makes no sense. Anyway, what I like about this first third is that there's a clear upward slope in terms of cool new gameplay mechanics and plot development. The game becomes more fun and interesting the longer you're playing, starting out perfectly decent like most Zelda games do, and then starting to get really intriguing towards the tail end of the first act. But most Zelda games go through a pretty prominent shift after said first act, and this shift is usually when they start getting really great. Ocarina of Time, boom, you're an adult and Hyrule's destroyed. Now go play one of the most phenomenal dungeons of gaming history, the Forest Temple. I said what I said. Wind Waker, boom, it's old Hyrule time and you're finally rescuing your sister and learning some crazy shit about the plot. Twilight Princess, Xant is like, boom, you looking for this? And 
and messes you and Midna up, leading to a crazy spooky quest to heal Midna and get Link out of his wolf form. How is Skyward Sword gonna follow up all this crazy shit? Well, there's an awesome cutscene where Link holds gear him back in order to let Zelda and Impa escape through a time portal. Wow! A real time portal? Yes, Putt-Putt, a real time portal. The gate is destroyed and Girahim pieces out, so Link returns to the old woman at the seal grounds to figure out what the heck he's gotta do next. This is where Groose shows up, again, another big plus, and we gotta fight the Imprisoned, which is apparently a cursed form that the ultimate evil demon lord was forced to take on. Why is his cursed form bigger and more threatening than his normal form? Uh, who cares? He looks stupid! But the fight isn't bad it's pretty easy to slash his toes and defeat him once and for all let me repeat that once and for all now that that's all done with it turns out there's a second gate of time here at the steel grounds ah perfect so this game's major hook is time travel again except this time into the distant past that'll lead to some interesting adventures what an exciting development how's that gonna change the dynamic i guess we're gonna find out oh and there it is this is the moment where it all goes wrong. Instead of a crazy new development happening in the world or to Link himself, we must instead return to the same three areas we just explored thoroughly and power up our sword with three sacred flames. And we know that none of these three escapades are going to result in us reuniting with Zelda, since we need to get through all of them before we even have a chance to make it to the distant past and see her. Yeah, I, I mean, the motivation's still there, like, we know we'll reunite with her eventually, but it seems so far away now that it's taken a bit of a dip. Still, how bad ad, ad, ad can this be? Let's see. Uh, let's let's also. Uh, this wasn't in the script initially, but I should probably split this up into a different part because this is the second act, and this would go on for too long otherwise. Uh, part five. Here we go. The Faron Woods revisit kicks off with the introduction of the Silent Realm, which is pretty badass and definitely one of the coolest parts of this game. You just collect sacred tears in this ethereal plane and try not to get sliced up by these guardians. <laughs> The tension and atmosphere here is fantastic, and it really helps that you got to know this area so well on your first visit, since now the game's testing your ability maneuvering it. The Silent Realm concept is also done in the remaining two areas, and they appropriately ramp up in terms of difficulty. Completing this first one lets you swim underwater and explore a whole new world, which is kind of boring actually. It has these generic fish creatures you barely interact with, and then you meet the water dragon. She's been weakened by Giraham and needs liquid refreshment, man! Is there a new area for you to explore and find this liquid refreshment? Ha! Huh, no, you just have to backtrack through the first dungeon again and fight some mini-bosses that are already used elsewhere in the game. Okay, but why? This is blatant padding that did not need to be in the game at all. The approach to the water dragon was a perfectly fine amount of content to have in between dungeons. But this is the first instance of Skyward Sword's biggest structural issue. This game is so insecure about the length of its main story that it stretches out the time in between dungeons with some truly abhorrent level reuse and filler fetch quests. This sort of stuff would have been fine as optional content, but as is, feels frustratingly unnecessary and tedious. And don't worry, this little errand you go on for the water dragon is just the beginning. Fortunately, this second act of the game does have the best dungeons overall, and this next one is my favorite in the whole game. Plus one of my favorites in the whole series, the Ancient Cistern. It's absolutely beautiful and it comes with a lot of thematic depth, which is a rarity for Zelda dungeons. It pays tribute to the ancient Buddhist tale The Spider's Thread and appropriately features a pristine, above-ground area juxtaposed with a hellish cellar at the bottom. The game's art style really shines here, the puzzles are satisfying and the whip is pretty fun to use. And to top it all off, this dungeon's boss is Kaloktos. Even though the button controls in the HD version nerf the satisfaction I feel during this fight, it's still Kaloktos, one of the best bosses in the entire Zelda series. So overall, this small stretch of the game here had a shaky middle, but a rock solid beginning and end. Moving on to the Laneru Desert, which after taking you through the Silent Realm again and granting you the claw shot, introduces the Sand Sea and lets you live out your childhood dream of visiting Robot Pirate Island. This stretch of the game is a fan favorite, and while sailing on the Sand Sea is a very cool effect, Eh, I don't know. I hate to be a contrarian, but I think the novelty wears off pretty quick here. You can't really explore it like the Great Sea, you just move to your destination. And these destinations are kind of a wild goose chase where you have to get things for this pirate captain, and some of the places you go to end up being pointless, and you have to refight the same boss in the mining facility for some reason. And it's not like that boss was even that good, I mean, that's not Kaloktos. Yeah, this area kind of tries my patience a little bit. It doesn't reuse a level like the Faron Woods misadventure, but it's frustrating because it feels like you're not really making progress 
here at the rate you want to. But the Skipper himself is a fun character who has an interesting history. And plus, this all culminates with the Sand Ship, the second best dungeon in the game. I love this place. It pushes the time stones even further than before unless you use them in a really cool location. It's a pirate ship. Also, you have the bow. That's epic. This entire dungeon is wonderfully creative and a cool change of pace from most Zelda dungeons. It feels like a really cool swashbuckling adventure, culminating with a sea monster taking over the ship. And insert Mike Wazowski joke here. I feel like all the best Mike Wazowski jokes were used back in 2012. You're green with it! You're green with it! This fight's actually kind of fun though, not gonna lie. The design may be stupid, but it's satisfying to shoot this thing in the eye and cut out its tentacles. Now that business is all done, we return to Elden Volcano and do our usual Silent Realm shtick. Now we can go in super hot areas with our stylish earrings. But uh-oh, the game developers are feeling insecure because their super hot area isn't long enough. So we're blocked by a big ass frog switch that needs a big ass amount of water. Our bottles can't carry that, so we need to backtrack to the water dragon and ask to borrow her basin. So the robot picks it up and takes it to the volcano at the top of the mountain. Oh, oh wait, I'm sorry. He brings it to the bottom of the mountain in a scene that 10 years later, I still can't make any sense of. It is less work for this robot to take the water to the place that is elevated. Why would he take it to the bottom of the mountain and then force us to do a stupid pointless escort mission up the mountain that we have already climbed many times before? Oh no, he can't take the basin back to the sky and then land at the volcano. Oh, it's too heavy, ooh-woo. Tough shit. He works for us. In fact, he literally does all this because he simps for Fi. Couldn't she just send him feet pics? I don't know, that would probably motivate him to let us skip this escort mission. Come on, Fi, we don't have time for this! Zelda's life is on the line here! Just show the robot your feet! Why did I write this? The only thing worse than a bad escort mission is a pointless bad escort mission. Like, this is unacceptable. I see now why Breath of the Wild made almost every single aspect of the game optional. But whatever, you do the stupid fucking shitty robot escort mission and your reward is a shockingly standard dungeon. Like, after the last two bangers, this one is fairly unremarkable and I'm struggling to remember anything about it. Even the boss fight is just gear him again, which is fine. I mean, it's not like we're fighting the imprisoned again or something, but still, meh. And that was Act 2 of Skyward Sword. It had the highest points in the game thus far. Hell, some of the highest points in the entire series. But they really threw in a lot of backtracking and filler in between those high points when it really wasn't necessary. It's not like any previous Zelda game really had a ton of build up to each dungeon. Maybe the occasional mini dungeon here or there, but that's it. And it was very rare that they would ever reuse a level, with any instance of them doing so actually servicing the story and gameplay. Like, it was necessary for you to return to the Forsaken Fortress and Wind Waker story-wise, and it felt like a a completely different experience as you had not only your sword this time, but a plethora of other items and a ton more expertise under your belt. There's no good reason for Skyward Sword to continue reusing the same levels. Once you do the Silent Realms, that should be it, but they just keep coming and they don't stop coming and they don't stop coming and they don't stop coming. Still, it could have been worse. Speaking of which, oh look, the Imprisoned is back, but this time with arms. This fight is Fine. It's fun to use the Grusinator at least, and fighting him isn't too frustrating. There, we beat him again, and we finally did it. After all that, we go back in time to reunite with Zelda. We truly now have a link to the past. <laughs> yes, strike me down. Only your hatred can destroy me. The Zelda encounter is short but sweet. After such a long, grueling adventure, it's so great to finally see her again, even though you know the game can't just end here. And yes, Zelda must fulfill her duty as the reincarnation of the goddess Hylia and forever sleep in order to keep the seal on the Demon King Demise going. The only way to free her from this eternal slumber and destroy Demise is through the wish-granting power of the Holy Grail. Sorry, I've been watching a lot of Fate recently. I mean the Triforce. Fate review when? And before she sleeps, she reassures you that she's still your Zelda. And you have a really nice dialogue option where you resolve to wake her up. It's a beautiful moment. And then, she sleep. Guess there's nothing left to do but journey outside into the distant past and find the Trifo- Oh, what's that? We can't go outside? You mean this gate of time that we just spent the past three dungeons powering up our sword in order to activate was nothing more than a glorified cutscene generator? We're not gonna expand the lore of this game and explore its world in the distant past? Oh! Okay! That's cool, Skyward Sword! Very cool! I mean, I guess Wind Waker blue-balled you in a similar way 
say because of how non-explorable old Hyrule is, but at least we know that game ran into severe time crunch and looming deadlines during development, so of course they couldn't make an entirely new area. But with this game that was worked on for five years, don't you think it would have been courteous to give us somewhat altered versions of areas you already made that we could explore? Especially when one of those areas is technically already in the game, just fractured by time shift stones. Wouldn't it be neat if this game elected to do anything with the gate of time? Literally anything at all? Whatever. F*** it. Back to the present, I guess. Let's see what the third act has in store for us. So after a wacky misadventure where you have to deliver a giant bowl of soup to a mythical flying whale that got taken over by an evil worm boy, it, it it's really not important, who cares? You learn that in order to get the Triforce, you need to collect parts of a magic song from three magic dragons. Hoo boy. At this point, my motivation to continue the main story is at an all-time low. We reunited with Zelda already, and she's safe for the time being. Sure, we have to free her and make sure Demise is destroyed, but that's more so typical Destiny stuff, and not the strong personal motivation the first, and to a lesser extent, the second acts had. But I guess it's fine. And the nice thing about this part of the game is that you can actually get these song pieces in any order. Unless you were playing this game when it originally released on Wii, because there was a game-breaking bug where if you did the Laneru Desert song piece first, the song piece events in the other two regions wouldn't trigger and you'd be soft-locked out of completing the game. And since this game came out before Nintendo even knew what Wi-Fi was, of course they couldn't just update Skyward Sword the same way games today receive updates to fix glitches. Haha, <laughs> no. They needed to release the Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword save data update channel, which would patch your game and remove the game-breaking bug. If you're gonna play the original Skyward Sword on Wii now, I hope you already have this downloaded because you can't get it with the Wii shop channel closed. Just do Laneru Desert last to be safe, that's what I always did as a kid. With that said, from now on I'm gonna do it first because getting the Hylian Shield as early as possible is the optimal strategy. So let's start with the desert. This is easily the coolest one because there's actual new areas to explore and the Thunder Dragon, as I said before, is a bro. But first you find out that he got sick and died, so you have to plant some magic tree in the past so you can get a magic healing plan in the future to make him better. It's one of the most creative uses of time travel in this game, and it's a fun little puzzle to sort out. And once you get the song from this guy, he lets you do an optional boss rush which will net you the Hylian Shield, among other rewards. Many of the bosses in this game are bangers, so it's a welcome inclusion. And I must stress again, for the love of God, do this boss rush before you re-enter Faron Woods so a certain boss doesn't get included. You will thank me later. Even if you only have the Wii version without the save data update channel, I'm pretty sure soft locking your game and being unable to complete it is better than actually doing the thing that awaits you you in Faron Woods. With that said, Elden Volcano. It's a pretty decent stealth mission where you're thrown in prison and all your items are gone and you have to slowly get them back. It's nice to get a break from Fi after all. Despite the reuse of level with nothing new being added, I just think the vibe of the stealth mission is fairly enjoyable, though it's kind of brought down a bit by the justification for it. Apparently Link got thrown off course and captured because the fire dragon just had an explosion of his power. Bro, you can, you, you can say you had diarrhea, it's fine, no one's gonna judge you. That's the thing about Skyward Sword. There's never any good justification for a lot of the stuff you do. Even if it is enjoyable from a gameplay perspective, it nonetheless feels like pointless busy work that didn't need to be there, and it makes your quest feel significantly less epic or impactful. Sometimes you just feel like the goddess's errand boy, just putting up with the whims of these higher powers like Hylia or the dragons because it's your job, not because you actually want to save Zelda anymore. I mean, you still do, but you get so little payoff from completing each objective in this game that it's hard to remember how Zelda's safety is what you're fighting for. This lack of payoff for certain objectives isn't necessarily a problem exclusive to Skyward Sword, but it's such a recurring theme in the game that it really starts wearing you down by the time you get to this final act. But maybe I'm bitching too much. After all, I said the Elden stealth section was mildly fun, even though it would have been better if there was an entirely new area to explore and a less nonsensical reason for a stealth section to take place. Still, so far this third act has a good segment and a decent segment. Now let's head over to Faron Woods and finish strong. Oh no! Why the fuck do we need to fight the imprisoned a third time? What does that add to the game? We just fought him like an hour ago. You piece of shit. Ah! 
<laughs> Welcome to the worst boss battle in Zelda history and one of the worst I've ever fought in a video game. He moves way too fast and the Grusinator doesn't stun him for nearly long enough to slice up all his toes, meaning you have to sit there and wait for Grus to charge it up again. You can't slice the toes if he's not stunned because of these ridiculous, impossible to dodge shockwaves. Then when you get the toes sliced, this motherfucker takes up the entire space so you gotta go all the way around and hope he doesn't stand back up before you get to the seal on his forehead. You can bypass all that by jumping on top of his head and going straight for the seal, but it's still a pain to keep ahead of him enough to make it to a geyser and reach a higher level without getting hit by these damn shock waves then the dumb bitch starts flying and you gotta bomb it out of the sky but oh no the bomb supply has been cut off so you gotta race up there and let Groose catapult you on top of this guy's forehead it's somewhat satisfying to land on top of the thing sure that's the one bright spot in an ocean of shit but if you miss this shot you won't have enough time to try again because of how rapidly this pizza f approaches the temple this third battle with the worst zelda boss of all time is the absolute low point of the game and maybe the entire series that's not even an extreme opinion every zelda fan i know hates the imprisoned it's just a colossal failure of imagination and game design taking a super cool concept of a cursed demon king and turning it into a sesame street ass kaiju remember don't let this thing taint your boss rush mode do the thunder dragon thing first and you won't have to refight it at least it can't get any worse I hate the tad tones so much, you guys. You have no idea. Oh my god. So the water dragon flooded the entire forest to get rid of the monsters. She really just said, F the peaceful plant people who live here, huh? Cool. Very likable. Very great ally. Very cool. Thank you, game. And get this. Even though we saved her f***ing life earlier, she still isn't convinced that we're a good enough hero to hear the song part. What makes us a true hero in her eyes? Dicking around in the water and collecting tadpoles. Ma'am, there is a demon lord that came dangerously close to destroying the world three times now, and you want me to waste my time looking for music notes in this dingy ass water? Get all the way f***. This is the exact same problem as the Elder Volcano section, where we're doing something for no good reason whatsoever, except this time, it's not even mildly fun. It's tedious and agonizing. You're basically required to use the dowsing to track down the last few tadpoles, but you can't do it in the water, so you gotta keep dipping in and out to get a vague idea of what direction they're in. You can't miss a single one in the chain, or else they all leave your inventory and you gotta start the whole thing over. The swimming controls aren't that great, on the Wii they're terrible, and on the Switch they're just boring. It takes so long to get all of them, and it's easily the biggest waste the time in the entire game again why are we doing this the thunder dragon gave you a song because you saved his life the fire dragon just gave it to you no questions asked what is this bitch's problem is it because we broke her water basin that she didn't even need anymore who gives a shit oh that's all well and good but i can't go around giving away something that's precious to every hero who flounders around in my waters what the f are you talking about? Are there other heroes in your life? I am shocked that more Zelda fans don't hate the water dragon. They hate the tad tones as much as I do, sure, but let's not forget who made us do this despite it being completely irrational. There is not a single positive thing I can say about this segment or this character. The entire Pharaoh Wood segment is what really tanks the third act of Skyward Sword. It's the lowest point in the game and nothing as of yet in this third act has hit the same highs as the second act. But... With all that said, is what comes after this horrendous bullshit really worth seeing this game through to the end? Heck yeah, man! This last part of Skyward Sword is a banger! Oh my god! It's so good! The final Silent Realm in Skyloft was a nice challenging surprise. This is the area you'll be the most familiar with over the course of the game, so it only makes sense to bookend your adventure with a dangerous and difficult stealth segment here. The Sky Keep seems to be a fan-favorite dungeon, and like... I like it, it's good. I guess I just don't care for sliding block puzzles that much, even if rooms that slide alongside the block puzzles is a novel concept. But after we beat it, we collect the entire Triforce and Link wishes this upon the imprisoned. Yes! Kill! Finally, the Demon King is dead and Zelda's free. It's a happily ever after- oh, shit. Yeah, we never really dealt with Girahim, did we? So after insulting Groose's hair, which is the funniest interaction in recorded history, he takes Zelda back to the past where Demise is still alive in order to resurrect him there. And Link has to do battle with a horde of enemies. It's so good and dramatic and fun and adrenaline pumping. It's like, yes, the motivation to save your best friend and definite future lover is back. 
It's more visceral than ever. You've come this far and you can't stop now. Motivation is tantamount to Skyward Sword's strengths and weaknesses, by its very nature as a heavily story-focused Zelda game. The worst parts of the game are the ones that are completely disconnected from your deeply personal quest of saving your bestie. And the best parts of the game, i.e. this right here, are where your primary motivator is at the forefront. You will save Zelda, no matter what. Even though Girahim deactivated your beetle during this fight for some reason, he has truly taken everything from you. After the horde battle, you fight Girahim, who is like the anti-imprisoned in the sense that while you also fight him three times, he just gets better with each battle. This third fight is one of the best in the game, almost as good as Kolokto's even. It's challenging, satisfying, and an absolutely perfect conclusion to Link and Girahim's rivalry over the course of the game. And the music! Hot damn! Chef's kiss! Masterpiece! I will never understand why a game with so many epic music tracks only got Ballad of the Goddess and a remix of Ballad of the Goddess in Smash. Like, how are you not gonna have the final Girahim fight music? Come on! However, turns out Girahim was just stalling and the ritual was continuing in the background, meaning Demise is now reborn. Girahim accomplished his goal of reviving the Demon King. He actually won, and his victory here has tremendous repercussions for the rest of the series. I don't think we give him enough credit here for pulling off exactly what he wanted to do, and then happily trading his consciousness in for life as Demise's sword again. Demise himself isn't around for that long, but he makes a bone-chilling impression. He finds the idea of a human challenging him to be quite cute, and he creates an arena for the two to do battle. And Groos comes in with a save and catches Zelda out of the air. Aw, shit, baby. Aw, he's so cool. The fact that the Lord of All Evil acknowledges Groos as a worthy adversary to stand against him is truly incredible. Masterpiece moment. And the way Groos' theme is integrated into the heroic cutscene music. Oh my god, music is so cool. I like the vibes right before you enter Demise's portal where Phi tells you there's a 0% chance of returning unless you can beat him, and then wishes you good luck rather than spouting another percentage. That's pretty good. And so is the fight. Well, less so pretty good, more like pretty phenomenal. A duel for the ages, a visual and gameplay spectacle where you have to raise your sword to the air to catch lightning and slice him with it before he slices you. The air in this fight is electric, pun entirely intended, and it's so satisfying to finally land the killing blow in Demise after he faked you out and rolled out of the way the first time. One of the best final bosses in a series loaded with amazing final bosses. Demise curses Link and Zelda's descendants, and we all know where that goes. And finally, the evil is defeated, with what's left of Demise being stored in the Master Sword. And like, I'm not saying that means the Master Sword is cursed, but bad shit always seems to happen right after Link grabs it in every game, huh? Oh well, let's not worry about that. It's finally all over, in one of the most cathartic and beautiful endings in the whole series. This truly was The Legend of Groose 2011. We learned that the old lady was Zelda- wait, wait. We learned that the old lady was Impa the whole time. The Master Sword is laid to rest, and Groose heads home while Link and Zelda resolve to live a new life here on the surface. Yay! Oh, wait. Hold on. There's an 85% chance I'm forgetting something. I've been avoiding talking about Fi as much as I could throughout this video, and that's because of how conflicted I am about her as a character. I was kinda memeing when I said she was shit earlier, but also kinda not. And if anything, the HD version of this game made me even more conflicted. Let me explain. In the original Skyward Sword, Fi is just the worst. She's not hated for her personality, because she doesn't have one. She is an emotionless robot through and through, only dealing in facts and percentages throughout the entire game. That would be fine in and of itself, it's not as great as a dynamic character with her own arc over the course of the game like Midna or Tattle, but it's perfectly serviceable and unintrusive. And by unintrusive, I mean COMPLETELY INTRUSIVE! Fi never backs the f off constantly giving you unwanted hints and advice that you don't need 90% of the time. Her interruptions add nothing but annoyance since she has no endearing personality for you to latch onto. It's like having Clippy as your partner. Have fun, dicknips. Sometimes Fi has the occasional funny description of a character, and I remember her initial reaction to the simp robot was pretty humorous. But besides these brief glimpses of humanity, you just get nothing to work with in terms of her character. Her design is cool, but that's about it. She's just an annoying supercomputer in your pocket who won't stop notifying you about everything and there's no way to turn these notifications off. 
Unless, of course, you wait 10 years and pay even more money than you initially paid for this adventure. Skyward Sword HD does a great job of minimizing Fi's interruptions. I rarely ever got annoyed by her because she just kind of took a backseat role in the adventure, which for this game is certainly preferable. We had a delightful, painless experience together this time around, to the point where I kind of forgot about her for large chunks of the game. I don't think there was any way around that outside of rewriting her entire personality, which isn't really a great idea for a remaster like this. So you either get too much Fi or not enough Fi. I'll take not enough in a heartbeat, but I don't think either option works as well as they should when paired with the ending. The emotional centerpiece of Skyward Sword's ending is not Link and Zelda's relationship, or even Link and Groose's, surprisingly, but Link and Fi's. She tells Link that she must forever sleep in the Master Sword now that her duty to the chosen hero is complete. Link is upset about this and he's about to seal the sword, but first Fi emerges one last time to tell Link how she's saddled with unnecessary feelings. She can't fully experience human emotion, but she nonetheless looks back on her time with Link very fondly. She believes she's feeling happiness for the first time ever as she leaves Link with words he's heard many times on his journey, which she now wants to convey for the first time. Thank you. May they meet again in another life. On its own, this scene is tremendously powerful. They did a fantastic job with it. The problem for me lies with the rest of the game. On my first playthrough, before this game's flaws really set in for me, this hit me pretty hard. On my second and third playthroughs, my annoyance with Fi and her constant interruptions over the course of the game kinda kept me from feeling anything here. And on my playthrough of the HD version, Fi just felt like such a non-factor throughout the entire playthrough that this scene didn't feel as earned. I really wanted this scene to hit me hard again, and it's not like I have trouble with getting emotionally invested and hit hard by stuff I've already experienced before. It really is just the fact that neither of these versions were able to sell me on Fi as a character. If I cared about her more, her excellent farewell scene would be one of the highlights of the entire series for me. But they just barely missed the mark. Maybe if it felt like the two of them were bonding at all over the course of the game, this could have felt more earned, but Fi keeps silent about her character development throughout the entire adventure. It's understandable why, there's no in-character reason for her to mention that she's growing attached to Link until the very end of their time together, but it still paints her as a pretty disappointing character, one that was fundamentally flawed from the beginning and couldn't quite be fully saved in the final act. That's a good summation of Skyward Sword as a whole, I think. I'll always have fond nostalgic memories for it since it was my first Zelda, and it does a ton of things really well. But man, its low points are incredibly rough, and it frequently loses sight of what your primary motivation should be. Some Zeldas, like Breath of the Wild or Wind Waker to some extent, let you take the wheel. Your motivation is to explore and see what you can find in this exciting open world. Other Zeldas, like Ocarina of Time or Majora's Mask, never let you forget the strong story motivations for why you're doing what you're doing. You need to restore Hyrule to its former glory and save it from Ganondorf's evil rule. You need to stop that ever-present moon and that clock that's ever-present on your screen. Skyward Sword doesn't really have either of these benefits. The story is solid and your motivation to save Zelda is strong, but it's easy to forget why you're doing what you're doing when you get railroaded into tedious fetch quests and obnoxious backtracking that most Zelda games would have as optional content. Skyward Sword, by contrast, is so insecure about the length of its main story that it pads it out to an intolerable degree, forcing you to repeat content so often and do a ton of boring bullshit that it's easy to look back on this game and think, that's all Skyward Sword is. Just an overly long excuse for you to play around with motion controls that either lose their luster over time or were never that fun to use to begin with. I haven't even mentioned other problems with the game, like the barren sky that isn't interesting to explore, or the underdeveloped stamina mechanic that didn't add that much to this game until Breath ran wild with the concept. It's so easy to pick apart the worst aspects of Skyward Sword, because they're so much more blatant and frequent than the worst parts of other Zelda games. And because of how prominent the game's issues are, it's so easy for people to call this a bad game. Nay, the worst game in the series. Yes, there are people out there who legitimately think this game is worse than Zelda 2 somehow. I don't even think Zelda 2 is a bad game, but... Really? Come the hell on. I'm perfectly fine with dunking on stuff that I'm nostalgic for, so you know I mean it when I say that Skyward Sword is a decent game. And Skyward Sword HD in particular, with so many of the original's little annoyances ironed out, is a good game. I still hesitate to call it great, it's not as consistent as something like Wind Waker or Twilight Princess, but in my opinion, its highs are even greater than the highs of both of those games. And it's damn worth trudging through the weak or frustrating or outright bad parts of Skyward Sword in order to experience some of the greatest and most satisfying moments in Zelda history. 
Every Zelda game has its ups and downs. None of them are perfect, not even my beloved Majora and Ocarina. So it breaks my heart whenever people dogpile on Skyward Sword in particular for all its faults, while ignoring all the things it did right. The gorgeous art style, the amazing characters, the stellar dungeon design, the phenomenal orchestrated music, motherfucking Kaloktos, and the magnificent ending. If you can find a reasonably priced copy of Skyward Sword HD, play it. It's more than worth experiencing either for the first time or revisiting after all these years. I certainly had a great time doing the latter. I can't deny that it's the weakest of the currently six 3D Zelda games, but when the weakest game in a group is something this gorgeous, grand, and unbelievably fun throughout the majority of its runtime, that's how you know you got a damn good series on your hands. Thank you, Skyward Sword, for everything. May we meet again in another playthrough.